Hey guys, Stuart Tomlinson, Warrior Collective, uh, back once again for Inside Chat. I hope you're well, whether you're listening or watching this, no matter where you're in the world. Uh, I'm really excited to get started on today's podcast. Uh, uh, my guest today is a truly outstanding individual. Um, now, you might not have come across him because he's not really in some sense uh, in the same sort of martial arts world as a lot of my guests, whether they're from film or uh, from fighting and coaching. He's actually a renowned uh, fashion designer, fashion house founder uh, of Acronym. Uh, but he's also a very passionate martial artist as well. And, and and for me, like I said, there's many reasons why I'm very excited to have him on. Um, but I'm, I, like I said, I'm super stoked to have him on. Errolson, how are you? Are you okay? I'm very good. Good morning. It's a pleasure to meet you here. And uh, thank you so much for having me on the podcast. Uh, uh, it's definitely my first martial arts podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, like, like, like I said, it's 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 the first time that, uh, like, just before we started this podcast, obviously, you told me about Fashion Week, and I don't think I've I've ever interviewed or even spoken to a martial arts uh, individual coach fighter who's ever been involved in Fashion Week. So uh, I think you tick a few of the unique boxes right there. Yeah, it's a it's a weird couple of boxes to take, I guess. <laughs> but yeah. So uh, I mean, it's, it's it's there's so many places we can get started with this, but I had to kind of pull up a quote that I saw a, a while ago. And it made me laugh, and it was in it was in GQ actually, um, and the okay. the writer said, um, and this is this description of you, uh, a cheery, uh, unfailingly polite individual who looks like a uh, end of end of game boss end of level computer game boss and I thought that's an amazing description that I hope I hope someone who interviews me describes me in such a manner uh so uh, that's yeah, was a, that was a very cool write-up actually by uh Chris Gomali who's uh, who's also a martial artist he's a, he's uh, studying Muay Thai and um that was a fantastic interview actually it was probably the first one that sort of went beyond um you know most of the, the the press we get is about the products themselves and how they work and the technical aspects and that kind of thing. Um, that was one of the first to really dive into the reasons, you know, why are the clothes like that? And why are the things that we do the way they are? And he, he was very interested in getting into the background. So, um, yeah, and the martial arts came up quite a bit in our conversation as well. We even, uh, we in, even ended up doing a, a training session to kick off the interview. So before we did anything, we got down onto the, went out to the dojo and uh, put some gloves on and got the, got a little workout in, which is great. Oh, that, that, that's amazing. I, do you know what? I like you said, I really enjoyed that interview and uh, I like, I mean, I do t find interviews with GQ tend to be quite good, uh, depending on the writers, yeah. but yeah, they, I think telling the story behind someone's um, journey to, and the why's why they do something, especially with, um, like you said, some people can just focus on the products when actually, you know, it doesn't really tell the whole story, does it? Um, and and not one of the other things in that interview actually that that came out, and I, I'd already known this, but it's like fans of your work. Obviously, you know, you've got Jason Statham, who uh, I think he organised uh, you to be involved in the Hobbs and Shaw film, and then Henry Golden, um, who's a, a famous, you know, a, a really great actor. And actually. I was speaking to um, the stunt coordinator Kenji Tanagaki recently, and he oh, wow. was the stunt um, director for Snake Eyes. So he worked with Andrew Koji and Henry Golding, and obviously spoke great things about Henry, which I already kind of knew about. But the, but they know the name on the list that kind of really sprung out at me, and everyone's gonna be like, "Who's that?" It's William Gibson, and I'm like, "Whoa, no way, William Gibson! That's that's amazing." Now, for anyone listening who doesn't know William Gibson is William Gibson is um a very brilliant author writer um and i guess one of the original um authors of the cyberpunk genre 
you know, um, I don't know if he would like me to describe it that way, but that's how I remember reading his work growing up and the two books that stick in my head are Neuromancer and Mona Lisa Overdrive, which I loved when I was younger. Um, so I have to kick off with this now. William Gibson, uh, like, that, like I love William Gibson, so where's the connection come with that? Yeah, yeah I mean, William Gibson, um, probably the same for you. I read uh, his earth, his I think I read Neuromancer first, actually, when I was a, a teenager and, uh, you know, my head just exploded, literally. Um, it still blows me away that that book came out in 1984 and, uh, you know, kind of changed the way I, I thought about what was possible with writing. And uh, it was definitely my favorite, no, one of my favorite novels of all time. But, um, you know, so I've been a fan of, of William Gibson's work for for ages and everything he'd, he'd ever written. Um, but I was actually in Vancouver on a project uh, for a Canadian brand called Arcteryx. And uh, we were kicking off um, their bid into, uh, so away from the outdoor industry and into the menswear field, uh, uh, which is uh, a sub-label of theirs called Valence, uh, which is still going on today. And um, Kate Patterson was the person who had organized, uh, who was organizing that project. And we were having a meeting and talking about menswear archetypes. So like pieces of clothing that are like definitive staples in everyone's wardrobe. And one of the ones that was on the list was an MA1 bomber jacket. And uh, I had suggested that we obtain a sample uh, from a Japanese company called Buzz Rixon. Um, and and as soon as I said that, um, Kate goes, oh, Buzz Rickson. Yeah, I think they're in town talking to my uncle today. And I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> what do you mean they're in town talking to your uncle? <laughs> it's like, yeah, I think they're here for a visit. And uh, I was like, Buzz Rickson is like an like, otaku level, hard to find, you know, ultra niche, um, you know, there's even a whole segment in William Gibson's book, Pattern Recognition, about how rare and unusual these jackets are. And so I was just not expecting, you know, not only someone to know what it was when I mentioned it, but to actually know someone who knew the people who were behind it. Nevertheless, uh, never mind actually having them be in the city at the same time. So my next question was then obviously, who's your uncle? <laughs> And she goes, oh, he's just this writer guy. He just sits in his basement all day. I'm like, what kind of writer? He's like, science fiction. <laughs> I'm like, your uncle's William Gibson? And she's like, yeah. Do you want him to come to lunch tomorrow? And uh, I was like, yes, I do want him to come to lunch tomorrow. <laughs> so, so he did. And then uh, to my surprise, he actually showed up wearing an acronym jacket. And, uh, you know, We've been friends ever since. <laughs> so <laughs> that was a, a very unexpected, probably the, that was probably one of the cooler things that's happened in a, in a, a design kickoff meeting um, since I've been working. So oh, that, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah it was, it was truly, and even describing it now, I'm like, wow, that really happened. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, we have, we've been, been in touch over the years, you know, still to this day. Um, Largely, unfortunately, these days, you know, via Twitter and, and email, but uh, incredibly insightful, uh, just a, just an all round uh, incredible human being. Um, every once in a while, when I'm when I'm texting with him or emailing, you know, he'll s s send something over, and I'll be like, "Wow, yeah, it's really Will Gibson. It's really Will Gibson on the other side of this email." <laughs> I remember being so nervous when I first wrote him, like. Well, how do I form this sentence? Sort of, you know, <laughs> checking my grammar and like, yeah, but he's he's just the coolest guy, and uh, he knows so much about everything. Uh, he came then to the next, uh, um, he came the next day and stayed for part of the meeting, uh, where we were continuing discussing um, the brand that we were working on, and um, it ended up. I quickly realized that he knew more about menswear than than anyone else in the room, although he was, you know, a writer and not a designer. <laughs> it was like, okay, I'm going to ask you questions now. <laughs> As an encyclopedic knowledge of uh, many things. Um, yeah, just a, just a fascinating, fascinating person. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's funny, isn't it, how we kind of, when we don't know someone, we kind of put them in, okay, he's a writer, 
um, or you know, someone who maybe don't know you. Oh, you're a designer, and yet we we're made up of uh, m- m- multiple interests and passions, aren't we? And sometimes, like, oh my God, that's it's like like we said, like I said before, it's like having this 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 martial arts and kind of fashion design fusion um and, and i'm sure obviously there's much more to you than just those two things but you don't always put these things together do we so going back then historically how did you start in 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 martial arts how, how did your journey in martial arts begin um well according to my mom um i was always into it and was like you know when i was i must have been probably six or seven and you know asked her to make me a karate uniform for a halloween costume and and she's, she says she doesn't know where it came from, but um, my brother and I finally enrolled uh, in a karate class uh, in Canada. We were living in Edmonton at the time. He would have been eight, I would have been 10. And uh, we went down to the local YMCA and, and, and started doing karate there twice a week. And, uh, and that turned into like a good, you know, solid 10 years of, of regular practice. And... Um, that was it, and I was, you know, hooked. Obviously, from then on. So, what, what, what kind of karate was it then? Was it a traditional one? It was, a, yeah, it was very traditional. It was a wado ru, and um, yeah, it. Unfortunately, I had to stop training that when I left for university. So I left, uh, left Edmonton, and, and moved to Toronto, and uh, started going to school, and could only train like sporadically. You know? Um, but then I started obviously looking at, um, you know, every type of martial arts I could, I could find, I would, if I had the opportunity, I would go and, and try it out. And so, you know, done little bits of Muay Thai and Shaolin and Wing Chun classes, you know, wherever I could, you know, whoever was, uh, knew anything and he, you know, it was just like, like meeting a fellow, uh, collector or something. That's all you talk about and, and get into and, um, so yeah. So do you been there in the back. So obviously you've you've kind of dipped in and out of it obviously when you from moving you, you to university. Um do you still train nowadays? Uh what what's what's your what's your current martial arts training like? Definitely not as much as I would like. Um unfortunately the realities of of running an independent small business uh tend to wreak havoc with like anything like uh, a routine or or even like being in the same place for more than you know. Like, Except for lockdown now. Lockdown was great because it was the first time I didn't have to travel for like, you know, a good four month stretch. I, you know, that was like the first time maybe in, I'd say 15 years where I'd had that long of a period of not getting on an airplane, which was fantastic. Um, but uh, yeah, so, you know, the, the, the chaos that the fashion industry is and the size that our company is results in me, you know, being having a very, very sort of random lifestyle. So all I really do now is um, on a regular basis is just train by myself, you know, do some, you know, keep everything limber and try to do, get the push-ups in and some, <laughs> you know, throw some kicks so I can you know, keep the joints loose and, and keep going. But um, yeah, my, my big project now, I just turned 50 um, this week. Uh, is it still this week? No, it's a week ago. Um, <laughs> And uh, that's my goal for the next ten years is to is to get really disciplined back into training, sort of like no matter what the cost. Um, the company now I've been I feel like I've been supporting it for you know the last twenty years, and now I feel like it has to support me. <laughs> so, <laughs> priority shift and is in order, and uh, that's the thing I'm looking forward to the most probably. Um, in terms of like long-term goals is, is getting back to training and, and just enjoying it uh, on a regular basis. Well, you still keep yourself uh, in shape. I, I've, I like, I, I was, I saw, shared a video from your social media. I was like, I like, God, you know, that's some clean, some clean skills on display there. Like, like uh, with, with the, with the kicking and uh, I, I mean, I, I, I'm a, I'm a very, I love all martial arts, but obviously I came from very similar background when I was little, Went into karate, local school, same, exactly the same sort of starting point. Um, and yep. obviously, I, I kind of just made it. I, I never really wanted to do anything else, so I, I was kind of lazy. I just all I did was martial arts. I'm just not going to work. I'm just going. I'm just going to do martial arts all my life. And uh, so I can appreciate when someone's got 
got skill. And uh, you know, I when I was watching videos, like yeah, clean kicks, you know, clean striking. Uh, you kind of definitely still rocking it, you know. Um, I'm so, you and also, you, I, whenever I see you taking photos, um, like you know, I've seen you taking photos with the obviously with the with the with the brand in dojos in the in the gym with with obviously some of your uh, other other guys and um, people that you're training with or just shooting with. Uh, and I love and I, I love that kind of uh, look as well. You know, kind of like in the gym with with the brand, and and it just shows, obviously, I guess the you know who you are. It's your identity, isn't it? Some people would have drifted away from that because they'd have felt, oh, people aren't going to buy into that because it doesn't fit the dynamic of fashion. But actually, that's that's what I kind of love love more about it because you know you've got to you've got to put yourself, you've got to be genuine to who you are. Absolutely. I mean, there's nothing on paper that makes any sense about it you know, starting a super expensive technical outerwear brand based on martial arts. It doesn't, it doesn't like, you're not going to write that in a business plan and have people, you know, lining up to give you money. It doesn't, uh, but um, yeah, it's, it's really, I've said this before in other interviews too, but I think the Marlott's influenced um, acronym as a brand probably more than anything else. And, uh, you know, it, all of my understanding of clothing and what it could and couldn't do comes from martial arts um, and specifically, you know, you, you know, from my karate gi. And, and that was the first piece of clothing where I realized like, oh, I can do things wearing this that I can't do when I'm wearing my everyday clothes. And, you know, I remember being, you know, probably 11 and, uh, you know, driving my mom crazy, you know, trying to buy pants and throwing kicks in the change room and like, but not wearing these, I, you know, I, I can't do this. I can't kick anyone in the head. You know, like, it's like, and uh, and it, it, it was literally like a lifelong quest to like find pants that, you know, allow free of movement and, and head kicks. <laughs> so, um, you know, and then, and then also having started acronym, I was like, we finally, we did many years of like freelance contract design for you know, anyone who would pay us essentially at the beginning. Um, and then when we finally started to, we finally decided to start our own brand. Um, that was just one of the things at the top of the list was like, all, right, all of this stuff, you have to be able to do martial arts. It has to have full range of motion, zero resistance. And, uh, you know, so most of fashion, you know, you do a pattern and you sew a prototype. And you do what's called a fitting, where it's you try on a sample, and um, the pattern maker, the tailor, will work with you, and you correct the, you know the mistakes in it. And um, <clears throat> the highest form of that is probably um, in menswear is called tailoring. And in tailoring, you're always looking to get like a clean shoulder line, and you're essentially um, sort of encasing the the torso in like a uh, like a, it's almost like armor, like it's like molded to the body. So it's supposed to look perfect and, and still, and, you know, standing at attention, but, uh, and that's all great and, and looks really cool until you try to like talk on the phone for more than 10 minutes or, <laughs> or drive a car, you know, like, you know, there's very basic things that, that, um, traditional pattern making and, uh, tailoring doesn't allow for, um, never mind, you know, throwing an elbow or, um, <laughs> or, or, or a roundhouse kick. It's just, it's just not in the, in the vocabulary of tailoring. So I always, uh, you know, drove everyone in the office crazy too. And all the pattern makers, when they come to a fitting, whoever works with us the first time they come to do a fitting with us, they're like, what is going on? <laughs> why, are, why are you doing splits on the floor? <laughs> why are you waving your arms around? You know, uh, I think it's it's kind of a shock for everyone at the beginning, but but now it's become obviously part of the brand DNA because uh, you know people who you know do get an acronym garment into the jacket or a particular pair of pants, um, even if they're not martial artists, um, they very quickly realize even on a subconscious level, like wow, I'm just more comfortable in these pants, you know. Um, and I don't have to, I feel like I'm wearing a pair of sweatpants, but I don't look like I'm wearing a pair of sweatpants. So um, that's probably, you know, the biggest differentiator uh, of acronym to anything else um, is the amount of time that we spend doing the engineering to allow the freedom of motion. And uh, yeah, who would have thought that that would become like, you know, from being a kid, you know, 
11 years old trying to kick people in the head to uh, building an entire brand uh, that was never part of the plan. But oh, it's, like it's, you said, you got to stick to what you know. <laughs> stick to what's true for you. Honestly, I, I can think of no better reason to build a brand than oh, these pants just can't kick anyone in the head. I'm going to have to just build my own. Like, and that that's the start of an empire right there. You, you kind of sold me on that. And I think, I'm thinking in my head, I'm like, God, you know, that would have been the perfect job for me. Just come along, wear the clothes, throw some kicks and elbows. Yeah, I'm not happy. We're going to have to change that. I could just trial. If, yeah, throwing that elbow, it just feels a bit tight. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's exactly what we do. We always, you know. Like... <laughs> That's it. I'm like, ah, you know, we're going to we're gonna have to change that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so I guess utility then and function is is at the heart of it all. Um, and then with, you know, with, I mean, cause I, I'm guessing a, a lot of people will look at your, your style and, and, and possibly talk about, uh, you know, like we said earlier about William Gibson, cyberpunk, uh, cosplay, ninja <clears throat> tech, anime, manga, you know, the, all these people, cause again, it's cultural influences on the community, isn't it? And, you know, even for me, sometimes, you know, when you're looking at Japanese streetwear, you, you know, you kind of you're using labels that you kind of know, when actually that's not what the designers possibly thought. How how would you describe um, acronym then your your particular your way of um, the, the what what not labels I guess, but how would you describe acronym then? Um, primarily, we're trying to see a parallel as like an interface, so it's sort of like the interface between the the human body and the immediate environment and with that in mind we're always looking at clothes to be an enabler meaning we'd like you to be able to do more things with the garment on than you can do without it or with something else on and that actually ends up driving not only the technical aspects or like the materials and, and the fit but also the aesthetics like um how are you going to be perceived or are you going to be um immediately cataloged as a certain type of person who has a certain lifestyle and then you know you'll be accepted by a certain group of people but not by another um <clears throat> so we're trying to always design into this intermediate space where it's like oh it kind of reminds me of that uh but i can't quite put my finger on it like where is that from or whatever and and obviously you know to greater or lesser degrees of success um and then depending on what's going on in popular culture at the time, uh, everybody puts their own spin on it, right? So I would say around 2015 or 16, um, the whole techwear thing happened. Uh, that became like a word that people used to describe the style. And, um, and a lot of kids who were buying it would like purposely sort of shift it over into that direction. And there we go. They were wearing masks way before COVID and, and uh, they had you know, specific types of footwear and, you know, not just one bag, but like three bags and uh, lots of straps and, and uh, that kind of thing. Um, but I find those things go in waves and depending on who's wearing it, it really, um, it should be able to take on the style of the wearer, right? So, um, you know, there's another um, <clears throat> another guy I love talking to, Robert, who's, uh, his Instagram handle is uh, um, I'm going to get it wrong. One hundred percent, make sure I'm having a blank out. Yes, it is. It is what I thought. Thousand yard style. Thousand yard style. Um, it's funny because I just I just think of the icon. I think of everybody's icon. I don't think of actually using the top anymore. Yeah, it's terrible. Too much too much time on social media. Thousand yard style. Robert. He's a photographer, and um, you know his the way he rocks the acronym is completely different to anyone else. And there's you would never look at him and go, oh, he's wearing half the stuff he's got on his acronym, or, or that's an acronym jacket. A lot of people, you, you if they do the whole look and they they you know. I have a certain type of styling. Sometimes you can tell from like 50 meters away. That's what it is. But uh, when Robert rocks something, it's like um, it's his own thing. It becomes who he is. It's not about the brand. And uh, that's what I find the most inspiring is when people are able to incorporate it to that degree that it's 
it's it's truly an expression of who they are rather than who the brand is. Mm-hmm. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah. No, that that makes perfect sense. Yeah. So when when you're designing then, because uh, obviously they they always have that thing in business school, don't they? Who's your audience? Who are you making this product for? Who do you have in mind then? Yeah. Is, it, is it just yourself or do you have someone in particular in mind when yeah. you're designing? You don't do any of that stuff. So, um, <laughs> that's, that's, that's the other thing I realized over time too. That the way we do it is like the opposite of how everyone else does it. So um, no, we don't, we don't have like a target demographic or any kind of research or um, we just sort of have this instinctive direction that we're moving in. And nowadays it's mainly based on, um, well, we tried this before and it didn't work or we've had this prototype going and it's almost there. And, oh, look at this new material. We could try this. So it's very much about um, the actual craft of building something. And we're so deep into like the processes of, of, of things that uh, um, that's how the development happens. It's not like... It's a much more organic method. It's probably slower than everyone else, actually. Um, it probably also works the way it does now because our team is relatively small. So organically, everyone sort of, you know, ideally is on the same page and knows what's happening. Um, we don't have to do like, you know, 20 page PowerPoint decks to explain like this is, this is the style we're going for at the, at the moment. This is the direction everybody move, you know, towards here. We're not quite at that scale yet. So um, it's probably more uh, similar to like training, you know, like when you're, you're, you're working on a technique and you're like, uh, you try it out inspiring and it, it kind of works and then you modify it a bit, you go back, you try it again. And then over time, you're like, okay, now I've got this question mark cake or whatever it is. And this is how I do it. And when I, when I see it, it just becomes part of your, your toolkit. Um, that's the same way we, we design and develop details. So, you know, we'll work on something for ages. Um, we'll spend like three months doing a hood or like a pocket opening and, and nobody else does that because nobody's, you know, they're just not that crazy. And it, it, you can't really justify it in terms of um, hours and profit, like hours invested and profit that comes back out of something like that. Um, but if you come from the background of martial arts and you, and you know that, like, like I'm going to go home and I'm going to throw 10,000 punches <laughs> and I'm going I'm to get it to that, that, uh, that degree of, of innate fluidity, um, you know, we do design the same way. So we're, we're constantly working on, on little tiny parts over a very long time that at some point we know like, oh, this is going to turn into something that we can use across, you know, the whole collection or, or we'll change the way, you know, even in the manufacturing process, how something gets put together that'll make it more efficient or enable some new thing. And uh, I think that one of the main drivers we have is we're always trying to improve we're always trying to like which is also super martial arts uh, mindset always trying to make it better even just incrementally and um but yeah it's a it's a very time consuming process and it's not how any of the industry actually works um which is also why yeah that's the other reason the stuff is so expensive because uh, at the end of the day we just we just add up you know all of those techniques so you add up over time and, and the level of complexity goes up. Um, and because we're not designing to a target demographic, um, nobody's telling us like, okay, those pants have to be, you know, 249 and that's it, you know, stop now. Um, we just keep going until we're like, all right, we've done everything we possibly could and then let's prototype it. And then we just go kind of see where it comes out. And, and usually it's like, it doesn't make any sense on any kind of business level. But there are, thankfully, enough people out there who um, can appreciate the details and understand, the, you know, the reasons behind it, and, and and do end up buying, you know, the stuff that we make. So obviously, we're very thankful for that. But like I said, it's nobody, it's no, it's nobody's uh, idea of uh, a surefire way to make tons of money in the fashion industry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's and it and it is. It does sound so martial arts, and and especially uh, Japanese martial arts. Cause it, it reminds me of um, I, I can't remember the word, uh, but in Japan, where, you know, where it's just that obsessive mastery of one thing. You know, like this is this is this thing that we're gonna we're gonna truly master, and 
And it's like, you know, and I, and I put up something, a post just the other day, actually, just about someone can, someone can teach you something, but you're going to have to be obsessive about developing the art. You know, it's like, it's like if, if I give you a list of instructions, you can probably follow those instructions. You know, how do you throw a punch? How do this? But it's going to take a love, a passion and an obsession to refine that to the point where not only do you own it, but you can make it your own. You add your own flair, your own art, artistic touch to it. You know, and uh, that's, that's absolutely. I mean, Bruce Lee always talks about you know expressing yourself through the martial arts, right? And I think he said how he put in, you know, and yeah, you can, like you said, you can you can watch the video or whatever. But when Sencha throws a roundhouse or <laughs> anybody else, it's not the same thing. There's so many. Uh, it's like like a fingerprint, you know. It's an individual thing that's that's come, you know, based on the individual's physiology and and their training and their habits and their, you know, personality. It all comes together in those, um, in every single move, which is uh, what's, what's, what makes the martial arts so fascinating and, and one of the many things. Right? It's a great way of describing it, actually, because one of the things I've been obsessive about since I was younger was, um, obviously, when I was younger, I didn't have the internet and Google, so you had to go and find martial arts yourself and check it out. And I was always obsessed with, like, I wonder if they're any good. I wonder what they're going to be like. Because, uh, again, when I was younger in the UK, um, just being very restricted, the odd book you could find, a couple of magazines, and, and it was all very yeah. hit and miss. Uh, and that's kind of for me how it, where it started was, how do all these people train? Because some of it I'd look at it and I think, surely that's not any good. But I'd always have that. <laughs> But, but I'd always have that kind of inbuilt, you know, when you come from a traditional martial arts, respect, culture, ethos, yep. you've got to you've got to show respect, you've got to see if it works. So for me, um, I'm not one of these people that is about pulling others down. I'm more about, I want to go and find people who I want to, so this is how it's done, look at how great this person is. So for me, martial arts is like music, everyone plays different tunes, they all have their own way of doing it, and Actually, there is no bad martial art. It's just people sometimes are looking for something different from that martial art than the next person. And the only time it kind of becomes something negative is, is when the kind of business world crosses over and people try to say something false about it. You know, then you know, like, oh, this is the this is going to make you defend yourself in ten minutes. It's like, of course, it's not. So that's that's that fallacy there. That's that um, ridiculous idea but actually if we take that away and people are just authentic and genuine about what their martial is what what it's for why they do it then actually i've I've never been and i've been to thousands of places in my time i've never been anywhere and not right. taken some something from it you know um and again it doesn't have to be someone who's a famous coach or a famous gym i've been into small gyms with with people who are completely off the radar and i've like oh my god that's 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 amazing that's an amazing detail or or, or that's an amazing way of coaching it, or, or you're an amazing person. Because actually, it's a bit like if we're talking about um, anime and games, it's like people's kind of like power notches. If we had top trumps guards, they're all in different places. And I'm like, oh my God, you're like, you're like the best person I've ever seen at putting that detail across. Or I love how, like for me, I, I'm, not, I'm not the most social person in the world. So as a coach, that's brought that out of me. So my wife would say to you, my wife would say to you, it's got no interest in speaking to someone unless it's got martial arts related. And I, I, I have improved. I used to be really bad and I'd be like uh, staying off the radar on social events, but I have improved a lot now. Um, but yeah, I was just obsessed with, this is all that consumes me. Uh, and actually, so when I go and visit different coaches, I'm always, I'm always open to what their strengths are and it can be a physical strength. It can be a, a coaching strength. It can be something technical and, and yeah, it's, it's, it is, it's a strange thing. You'd think after all the thousands of places I've visited and I've been to a lot filming and traveling and I've never been somewhere that a, that I've not taken something from and B I've never seen someone teach the same way ever, never, never, ever. Um, it's, it's crazy. Incredible. Incredible. That's, that's so, I mean, I love the term martial artist. Like, I think that's such a great, um, you know, conjunction of ideas and, and words. Um, the fact that, you know, obviously martial, but the fact that the word they use the word, that the word artist is used 
also styles, styles of martial arts are, is also such a great thing because it really is that, it's an expression of an idea, right? It's, it's a way of doing something. And um, there's you know, millions of people and millions of ways to do it. And like you said, no one's gonna do it the same way. No one's gonna teach the same way or train the same way. steps that add up to one, you know, whole thing. And, um, yeah, amazing. <laughs> I mean, going back to um, acronym as well, going off what you were saying earlier on, um, you don't really mass produce, do you? You kind of, you just do small, small collections, um, which is unusual in itself. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I'm guessing some people have a, a kind of love-hate relationship with you on that one. They're like, I can't get hold of it. Like, how, how am I supposed to find it? You've kind of like done five yeah. copies of it, you know, five or five, five, uh, examples of that product how, how am I supposed to get hold of it so um was that and again I've, I've read a lot about um your ethos on sustainability and obviously you know looking forward to the planet and you know and, and not contributing overly to 
you know, the negative side of the fashion industry, which is that kind of uh, high volume turnover, not caring about the impact made in lots of different ways. So does that all fit together for you then? I mean, it fits together as well as we can make it fit together. Um, the limited run thing is a lot of people, are, you know, a lot of people think it's like a strategy, like an artificial scarcity thing. But um, with the acronym, it actually comes down to that the stuff is just really hard to make. And um, it takes a long time to train the people up to do it. It takes a long time to actually do it. And as a result, it's, you know, it's expensive and, and it's difficult. So um, we're also not at the stage or the scale where we can just be like, well, we'll just make a whole bunch and sit on them, right? Like everything we do has to sell, it has to work. So, um, you know, we sometimes are a little too conservative. We're like, okay, I think we can only sell this. And so that's what we make. And then later we're like, God damn it, we should have made twice that. But, um, you know, <laughs> uh, but it's, you know, you just never know. That's the, it's just part of the industry and, and um, that process. Uh, and so many times people are like, I can't get this. Can't you just make more? <laughs> I would love to be able to just make more, like you have no idea <laughs> how painful it is for us to like finally make something that everybody's into and, and not be able to get it to market because we just don't have the capacity. There's no more, there's no more time in the factory. The fabric doesn't exist anymore. There are so many things that we have to cut together.
think it's all around. It's a it's a better deal for you and and for the environment and, and just for everyone involved. So. Yeah, it's funny li listening to you say that. I'm like, oh, I bet people are like these people are going. The acronym pants that we can't get. Although someone's just rocking them to the farm, they're like, "Oh my god!" But but that and that's the, the opposite of a lot of fashion, isn't it? Like a lot of fashion is, you spend thousands on this one dress, wear it once, and you can never wear it again. You know, because its yep. its whole purpose is just to walk on the red carpet. Whereas obviously with yourself, it's about obsessing about the the function, the utility, as well as the the aesthetics and, and, and bringing it all together to form one 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 kind of um I, I guess one brilliant piece if that makes sense yeah it's it's the everyday use and the uh, you know the the constant repetition that's that's what that's what we're always about you know when you do a red carpet dress obviously there's a there's a reason for that that, has a, that also has a function right but um but, you know, we always, we always, again, we try to do what we're good at, and there's definitely people who are better at that type of thing, and there's plenty of them, and and power to them, you know. But um, I think there's not enough people looking at it the way we do, which is also good for us because it means there's lots of things to discover, and, and there's room to experiment and grow all the time. We're always learning things, and um, um, and that's why we're happy to you know to have these kind of conversations and, and explain that to people. Like this is this is why we're doing that. And, you know, with the hope that we can show, like, look, you can do it another way, even if we're all slightly crazy, and this is definitely not the easy way to do it. <laughs> like, and you might not want to do exactly the same thing we're doing, but like, hopefully, you know, we can inspire a couple of other designers to be like, all right, I'm going to try and do this in a non-standard, uh, non-standard way, or not adhere to all the norms of the industry, because. I mean, anybody who works in fashion knows too that the industry it's a it's broken right there's there's so many things that don't make any sense and are just uh, you know, legacy systems and ideas that just have no place really in in the modern world specifically with you know the looming you know climate uh, issues that are that are already starting to be part of everyone's everyday life and the new reality is is it's it's right there and uh that, that whole thing is going to take a huge cultural reset, you know, that's, mm. um, and that's going to, this all hands on deck kind of moment. So, and I think to get back to your point about um, individual styles and people and different ways of teaching, and that's, that's key, I think, to, to going forward as, you know, as humanity in total, because the problems we're all facing now on a societal environmental level, they're so massive that, we need everyone's ideas and everyone's approaches and and the lessons we can learn from every you know culture every location they're all going to be needed and and so promoting that sort of open dialogue and and open-mindedness is is key i think so yeah we're gonna do our we're all gonna do our part you know no well you know it's funny you got me um it, kind of reminds me of what of one of the things that I've been thinking for a long time is actually you know what 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 one of the things that I've always enjoyed doing and what you know one of the things that I think is one of the main ethos is behind me is to I think one of the things I love about martial arts is helping people it's empowering martial arts you know if you if I look back to when I was younger you know I, I grew up without a dad and for me it was you know it kind of I was looking for something but it gave me what I needed not just what I wanted and for me then I kind of like martial arts coaching and teaching and, and passing on is, is in helping and empowering others. And people take different things from martial arts depending on what they need as well as what they want. And so one of the things I always think about like with Warrior Collective is I'm kind of like, I want to help, I want to help people learn martial arts. But more importantly, I think I want to help the coaches um, who are helping others. It's that ripple effect, isn't it? If, if you help Amazing. someone in this area, make what they do better in some way then that ripple then becomes bigger so you're dropping stones in in all these different places so i always think about um so i'm videoing i'm promoting coaches i'm trying to give people access to a resource that's free i'm trying to kind of all do all these things but the the, the heart of it it's not really a, about competition it's about coming together and actually growing Absolutely. and from the from the the shared experience and and, and understanding that if, if you help one person, 
they're going to help four more. And, and there's that kind of ongoing ripple, isn't it? Absolutely. I think that's the thing that all martial artists share, even if they're not consciously aware of it. If you've, if you've trained martial arts and you've been in a, in a, in a dojo or a gym um, and learned things, that entire the community that a martial arts club is and the way it works, it fosters that kind of thinking because you know it's it's not just the instructor and you, it's it's the other students and, and you're gonna learn as much from the person training next to you as you are from you know the person at the head of the class. And and you can't do that without respecting each other. And you can't do that unless you sort of leave all of your ego and all of the preconceived notions you have even how your body works, right, um, at the door and just and, and you're, you're there with an open mind to learn because you're going to do things that are, they're going to hurt and they're uncomfortable and they seem strange and they don't make any sense at the beginning. Um, and they take a lot of time and effort to work through. But once you do, you have these, you know, moments of success and realization where like, wow, now I get what they were trying to show me. And it's such a beautiful feeling. And I think it's a pretty universal martial arts experience too that you then, like you said, you want to pass that on and, and help other people to do that and, to, and to, to have that same realization that you had. And I think that's the one of the most beautiful things about the martial arts. And, and one of the things that I would love to see, and I'm sure you as well, obviously, uh, move out of the dojo and into the rest of the world, you know, um, because you know, at the end of the day, we're all in this together. And it's, it's, it's only going to help. Um, and those positive feedback loops, those ripples, you know, dropping those stones, they, they come back and that's how things move forward. So. No, I, I agree completely. Um, I mean, I've, I mean, I've, I've just thinking as well is if uh, my wife is like, she, my wife, I'll tell you, so my wife thinks I'm terrible at clothing, dressing. She's horrible. And I was just thinking if she, she'll probably shoot me if I don't take this opportunity to speak to a top fashion designer and go, Okay, well, how do you recommend? Uh, and this is perfect as well because I want something that I can kick head height in. So this is perfect. What what, what should I have in my wardrobe then? How how can I how can I dress the acronym? How can I dress better? What do what do I need in my wardrobe then? This is a this is a question that my wife will shoot me if I don't ask. That's so funny. Well, I mean, unfortunately, like like with martial arts, dressing yourself is also an expression of yourself. So you only you can really know what you're comfortable in. But if you feel comfortable and you feel like yourself, you're, you've, you've already done the job. So, um, but I mean, I'd be happy to send you some pants. Actually, <laughs> <if you think. laughs> uh, uh, so she, 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 she's probably imagining, oh, she's, he's speaking to this fashion designer. He's, he's going to get all these ideas about coming back wearing Gucci and, and she has no clue about anything <laughs> like with martial arts. And I'm like, yeah, it's probably not going to be that kind of conversation. You, you don't know. Uh... Probably know what you're <laughs> yeah, watching GQ. Oh, he's going to come back wearing this suit. He's not going to wear martial arts stuff anymore. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because I, I de I'm definitely the same. I'm, I'm, I kind of, uh, I do f think about you utility function because because i live in the gym if i never live don't live in the gym i'm on the road filming all the time so i'm always doing something physical um and uh and again my, like i i i'm not really a, a massive thing about oh, i have to look good 24 7 uh I, I i know what i like and i know what i want from it and i'm like you know so she, she it makes me laugh she just she has that 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 kind of hidden thing where uh, you know you, you could dress you know a bit more smart and i'm like but then I just end up taking it off when I go training. I'm like, I just, there's, there's, no, there's no purpose to it. You know, if, if yep. you know, uh, back in the 80s, Chuck Norris would be with, wearing the jeans and like, these jeans, you can kick in these jeans, you know, and I'd have been wearing those jeans. Those jeans are going to be my jeans. I can, I can spin in head kicking them. They're practical. They're, they've got a, they've got a reason. I can never, I can never find those. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted those jeans so bad too. I was like, where do I get these? Yeah. But, yeah, no, it's, um, you really just have to dress in what you're comfortable in, number one. There's nothing worse than, than not being comfortable. Um, and I fully understand that. That's why, I mean, that's why, that's how, that's how it all works in the end. That's why the t-shirt is, is everywhere. That's why people wear sweatpants. That's why sports wear taken over everyday clothing, because it's just more comfortable, period. And, um, 
no amount of social pressure is, is, gonna, is gonna defeat that in the long run. You know? like, cultural standards will change before comfort goes away. <laughs> well, I, think, I guess there's another thing people are gonna be like, oh, you need to ask this is, um, how, how how does someone get hold of acronym stuff because it's like oh my god you know i never get anything that i want so is is there is there a is there like a, a schedule of releases because i know a lot of people now they're spending more on um used second hand on like grail and stuff than the than the original cost of the the piece in the first place aren't they which is crazy, yeah. Which is, um, it's died down, it's, it's calmed down a little bit now. Like we're, we've upscaled some of the production of some items, so there's a little bit more available. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, that was a little, that is a little concerning to, to, to see. <laughs> um, yeah, one of the things that we're working on with Acronym is actually scaling so that we can, um, you know, make things more available, make them slightly more democratic. It's never gonna be cheap. Um, compared to other alternatives out there. They just don't have the, the same, uh, you know, production and design development costs that we do. But, um, you know, with scale of manufacture, we can reduce some of the, the costs. And uh, that's our goal, you know, now is to grow a little bit and to and make things more available to prevent these sort of, you know, crazy shortages that, that uh, can allow for things like aftermarket acronym jackets to be sold for two or three times the original price, which is already a lot. Um, it just doesn't seem healthy to me. But um, yeah, getting acronym at the moment though, still, can be still be pretty painful <laughs> if, you're after, if you're after a specific thing um, in a specific size, it can sometimes be quite a, an adventure. Um, but I guess that's also part of the part of the appeal even to some people because they, they want to have something that they not going to see everyone else in yeah and, uh, and then also i've actually heard a lot of stories about you know friendships that have kicked off because you know they met on some forum or some discussion board talking about a specific thing and then um, eventually met in real life and then you know so the connections made through that process is, is also somehow become part of the acronym experience for for certain members of the community which i think is that's super cool um it's kind of a reflection of how we originally started. Um, I would say the first five years of acronym. If you saw somebody wearing acronym, you could walk up to them and go, "Oh, I had dinner with Erlson last week." <laughs> it's like, "Oh yeah, oh yeah, I'm friends with him too. I know him. I met him there <laughs> for a very long time." Uh, it was all word of mouth, and everyone who knew acronym actually personally knew us. So it was. Uh, I like to see that kind of that kind of connection happening now with members of the community so it's cool and and you've always done um you've always been been into collaborations haven't you what what have been some of your favorite collaborations then because i've seen some of your collaborations and they're like oh they're amazing because it's not many people that collaborate as much as i've seen like you've collaballated with is that is that been on purpose or like you said before was it just you know uh because Actually, obviously in the early days you didn't have acronym as a standalone um design company yeah, I think actually, in, for a fashion brand, we actually don't do that many collaborations. I think for compared to any other industry, yeah, we do a lot. But um, I think fashion now is at the stage where I mean, I just I was just on a call just before this one where one of the people on the call said, you know, collaborations is it's broken. That's that that has that's a container that has more value in it <laughs> um, because you know, at this stage there's some brands that are all they do is collaborations <laughs> there's nothing else um, so the ones that we do um because of the way we work which is completely non-standard uh the main thing is that the partner that we work with can put up with us <laughs> they understand that the, you know the kind of ride they're in for is, is going to be what it is um and that we want to have different results you have to and you know engage with us and go on this different process um but uh, I mean, the one that's probably the most widely known is, is uh, a series of Nike collaborations we did. That was a lot of fun. Um, and the reason we did that is again, to try and make something that, you know, the kids could afford and they could be sort of uh, more democratic. Um, that's also sort of like interesting for us on a, on, a, on a pop cultural kind of level, because you get to work with these, you know, iconic 
on sneakers and, and, and designs and sort of put discipline. Um, also, people are just so into sneakers at the moment that the resonance that comes back is so strong and highly opinionated. You know, people hate it, people love it. It's 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 always very entertaining to see. It just gets a rise out of everybody for, for some reason right now, more than anything else, I would say. Um, yeah, we've got a couple of really interesting ones uh, coming that I'm not allowed to talk about at the moment, but um, that are not in the apparel industry. Uh, so that's super fun because it's, again, you get to learn like you when you travel and, and go to different trains and meet different trainers. Um, we did the same thing with our freelance practice where we would work with um, tons of different companies to do, the, you know, we were hired guns and so we'd um, end up going and getting to see the insides of all different types of companies and, and realizing like, oh, these guys are really good at this. And this organization type is really suited to doing that. And they're terrible at this because of you know the way they're set up and whatever. so it's super fascinating and um, and the collaboration is even a step further where um ideally the consumer the end uh gets to see manifested in the product like the different cultures together and uh and they sort of emphasize because of the contrast that they have um so collaboration is always a lot of fun, but it has to be the right, it definitely has to be the right fit for us to, to make it work. Um, yeah, the computer thing was really good last, was, that was the pandemic collab, that was great because everything shut down and we were just able to focus on that for a while. Um, that was the first time we worked with the um, computer industry to a laptop with Asus uh, Republic of Gamers. Um, Another one that was really amazing was to work with the uh, Kojima Productions on their video game mm -hmm. Death Stranding, um, and uh, you know design clothes um, that ended up in the game, but then also some of the merch. It's not really it's a, it is it is technically still game merch, but it's at an elevated level that I don't know if you can really call it that. Um, it's it's far beyond just putting logos on the <laughs> on a sweatshirt anyway. Um, that was fascinating to see how they work and, and their processes and just how I mean just how good they are at what they do. That's always fascinating too. Um, insights into into processes and into working styles and, and organizing. Even just seeing the inside of the studio, how it's set up, and um, you know, probably the best thing about. Uh, the job is is getting to meet interesting people and seeing how they do what they do. So, well, yeah. When when I look at your Instagram um, account, it's always like filled with such amazing visuals. You know, it's like uh, you know this the stylistic of the video and the you know it's almost it's almost like tech company. You know, like uh, in its you know in its in its high end kind of like you know um, obviously it's it's I, I know that. The design and, and the fashion is the, the 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 thought process behind it, but there is this there some amazing visuals um, on the videos and the productions that you're involved with, and it, and that's obviously, like you said, the collaborations that you wanted to work on, but also your influences and and, and touches within them. So, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, I love I love watching the videos that you put. Up. They're always uh, they're always amazing. Thank you very much. Yeah, we have, I probably have the most fun making videos of ever of everything that we do. It's uh, um, it's funny because I guess with the clothing we're so deep into the craft and the and the, and the, the way things get made and we know so much about it that sometimes it's like it's a lot to carry you know you're like okay we have to do it this way it has to be that way um, and with video it's like we don't know anything about how to make videos so we're just like you know what let's just try it <laughs> see, and see what happens and, um, we started out we'd always have one day. And at the beginning of the day, we, we were like, this is what we got in the studio, in the room. And whatever we've got here is what we're going to use. And we're going to be done by the end of the day. And um, so it's kind of a fun, like, spontaneous exercise. Editing and everything else would take, obviously, much longer. But, but the actual production, the actual shooting, um, we had these very clear parameters and, and simple tools, I guess. Um, and that's a real, that was really fun because the creativity then really starts because you're like, all right. The camera does slow-mo. No, no, it doesn't. Okay, so what does it do? Um, 
you know, what kind of lights do we have? <laughs> How's the setup? Um, and uh, yeah, we were always always surprised by what came out at the end. Like um, always something new, and always learn something in the process. So freestyle is not something that happens um, with the garment construction. So it's uh, a good outlet on the video side we get to just play around a bit. Yeah, it always looks amazing. Um, so, so then, if we, what's the future look like? Then, what what goals are still left for you in 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 both martial arts and fashion? Then, if we if we look at them as two two separate houses, what what's 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 the what, where do you want to go with with both? Then, um, actually, it would be the same thing for both of those things, and that would just be just to keep doing it. You know, we. Um, simple as that sounds like an acronym everyone always asks what's your what's your goal what's your next thing it's and for us it's really always just to be able to make the next season <laughs> you know, like it's, it's a very simple linear thing um but that's because you know actually doing it is, is quite difficult and there's a lot of there's so many variables that have to come together to actually make that happen um, that if we just focus on the thing in front of us that we're doing now and, and keep going, usually it, it works out. And uh, and I think that's the same with, with that's, that's also a martial arts thing too, where it's just, you know, as Mayamori Musashi famously says, you know, the way is in training, right? There's, there's no secrets. You just go and you do it. <laughs> and uh, that is the path, you know, that you should be following and that's that's what leads eventually to you know enlightenment for lack of a better word um the ways in training well that sounds like a a good a good uh adage and model to live by definitely uh, i i you know i always like i'm just like you i'm like oh you know i've got a, how am i fitting training in this week and like you know, sometimes like, cause I, cause I think I spoke to you before about finishing that book. I'm like, this book is driving me insane. It's like, it's taking up all my time and I want to go training and like, and then sometimes it's like, cause I'm a, obviously as a coach as well, I'm teaching others. And then a coach is about obviously giving time to the people. And then you're like, oh, but I want to, I want to kind of take some time for me. And it's like, it's, it's that balance, isn't it? It's like, you know, that, that giving yes. and taking. And it's, it's so easy to get into a point where, you're kind of giving everything and then before you know it you're kind of like pff, you deflated yourself because you need that constant you know intake yourself don't you yeah absolutely and that's the like if i have a personal goal it's to get that balance you know in line again because it's, it's definitely totally out of balance right now <laughs> i have the same thing where i'm like always on output mode and i um i'm just realizing like okay i can't keep doing this for the next like if i do this another five years I'll have to retire. <laughs> That'll be it. I'll just be, I'll just be empty. So yeah, but yeah, that's the process, though, right? You gotta, yeah. you gotta love the process. So whatever it is you're doing, if you're you're writing a book or you're you're training or you're designing pants, <laughs> you have to love the process, and and, uh, and that has to be the goal, you know, in and of itself. Uh, completely uh, well I, I know you're super busy so I, I want to kind of uh, thank you so so much for sparing the time to, to to speak to me today I'm sure everyone who's been watching listening is going to really enjoy this and they're going to be like why is there no secrets to get an acronym product but there's no secrets guys you've got to got to put the work <laughs> in uh, for, for anyone who wants to learn more then um, is uh, is it just social media website where, where should where should people head to yeah probably um Probably the website is probably acronym acrnm dot com is our is our main. Uh, you can see the products there that are currently available and, and yeah, and then social media and um, there's quite a few forums uh, around, but those can be you know some of them are um, more welcoming of new people than others. <laughs> it's what it that way. It's, it's fandom is in a weird space right now, I think, but. Um, yeah, just really ask me questions or if there's a retailer, that's usually the best thing. If there's a local retailer in your, where you live, then head down to the shop and start up a conversation. Um, or just ask me questions on Twitter or Instagram or whatever. I always try to answer. Um, yeah, look forward to hearing from anyone who has questions. Uh, it's definitely a, a weird sort of 
black hole to dive into uh, if you're into that kind of thing. Oh, brilliant. Well, guys, make sure you do make sure you go and follow, uh, follow Ellison on uh, Instagram and check out the acronym website. Um, thank you once again. It's been amazing. And I, I look forward to, to, to trying to jump onto the next uh, acronym release before it all disappears. It's, it's like, it's like, it's like waiting and like, like, it's like waiting for like uh, the, the, the lottery. I'm going to, going to get on it. Um, but thanks. Thanks again. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much, Stuart. It was a real pleasure to be on this podcast and uh, fascinating to talk to you. And uh, really appreciate the work you're doing. Can't wait to see the book. And uh, I'll send you some pants by the mound. I'm always happy to have new, new test wear testers out in the field, especially martial artists. I, I would literally never take those pants off. That's all you would ever see is just me in the gym kicking. <laughs> and I'm like, they, they, look at these, look at the functionality. I appreciate this kick to the face because it's, it's been, I'm wearing acronym <laughs> pants. These, these, these were made for this purpose. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. All right. All right. Thank you once again. Take care. Thank you. Have a good one.